Well, praise the Lord, everybody. We greet you tonight with Jesus' joy. As always, we are grateful and thankful for this, another opportunity God has given us to assemble in his house and to delight ourselves in the study of his holy and his righteous word. We greet those of you in the building equally. We're grateful for those of you who are joining us by Zoom. We are praying God's blessings be upon you and that you are, we're grateful that you are in our midst in the virtual format. Um, thank you, Deacon Gage, for leading us in prayer tonight. We know that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And we're also grateful and thankful that we were led in music ministry by two of our young people, so we praise God for, for them. Amen. Um, tonight, I pray that you've had a, 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 a good day. I hope that you're not overly exhausted because I'm going to tug a little bit on your on your thinking capacity. And you, you, those of you who are in the room and perhaps those of you who've joined us virtually, you have a handout in front of you. Uh, but before we get to the handout, I did some modifications from last week to this week. And there's kind of a preamble that I want to share with you um, before we get to what you have in your printed uh, materials. Uh, I think Khadijah has the updated information on the screen, so you should be able to follow along on the screens here in the sanctuary. Um, but we want to begin, uh, we're still in our series in reference, as reference is it's time to rethink it. It's time to rethink it. Um, we are building that series theme on the basis of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Um, this segment of the series is called The Branded Mind. Uh, so I want to begin tonight with reading Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, to set our context. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And I lose the vision. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Thanks, Khadijah. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, that's Romans 12, 1, 1 and 2. You can see it on the screen now. Uh, we built, again, this series based on the words, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Thusly, we're talking about it's time to rethink it. Now, I want to, I want to make note of for this lesson, um, the continuing words that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to emphasize that it is the will of God that we are focusing on. If you look again at Romans 12 and verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So I emphasize and underscore um, God's reference in the passage because it's going to be significant to what we're going to talk about tonight. All right now, I want to begin. Y'all with me? Wave at me if you. I just want to make sure you you're with me. All right, um, and I'll do this. Those of you on online, wave at me because you're going to do some critical thinking, different than what we've been doing. We're going to do a bit of theology. We're going to do a bit of theology. Now, theology is the study of God. Ology means study. Theos is God, or theo means God. So theology is the study of God, all right? Most times we ascribe theological studies to students who attend seminary, right? Or those pastors, preachers, or teachers who go for formal religious teaching or religious education. And we don't oftentimes think about theology in terms of our Christianity or us being Christians. But the truth of the matter is, is that if you are a Christian, you have a theology. You have a theology. You have a concept or a belief 
or an ideology about God. Am I making sense? Oftentimes you don't pay much attention because as a result of being religious, we don't talk a lot about what is our theology, our, our, our God philosophy, if you will. In the midst of Christianity, there are three primary viewpoints as it relates to theology. Now, before we deal with this, I want to I want to magnify a term. Y'all stay with me. This is going to sound like school. I mean, real school, now, not like Sunday school and church school. This, this is going to sound a bit like real school. But at any given point, you're not clear on what I'm saying. Stop me before we get to the handout material. OK. That was a question. This is yes. This is OK. <laughs> this is I don't know what you're talking about. All right. So so. um. The word imminent, say imminence. Now, imminence refers to God's quality, God's quality in all of the variant quali qualities of God and, and, and God's qualities being contained within things in the world. God's qualities within things in the world refers to the imminence of God. God is in it, right? And he's imminent within it. So anytime we start talking about a theology, right, a study of God, it is from the perspective of God being in the world and how it is that we believe God is in the world. Are you with me? And again, all of you have a theology. You probably just never thought about it before. Now, there are three primary views concerning the imminence of God. The first is the theistic view. Theistic view. Just as in the word theology, the, the, in the theistic view refers to the God view. But it, it is a God view from an ultimate God priority. Does that make sense? That God is the ultimate priority. And as such, God exists and is imminent in the world, yet he transcends it. I'm going to say it again. God is imminent. He's in and throughout things in the world, right? Yet the theistic view says he's in things in the world, but he transcends the world. What does that mean? That means then that God can be in everything, but he's also over and above it. And as a result, he's able to do things in the world and not be totally subject to the world. Scratch your head. Say, what pastor talk about tonight? Okay, stay with me. God is in the world. In all things in the world right? But yet, the theistic view of God says he's in the world, and he is above the world. He transcends the world. It would make sense because, watch this. Let me see if I can break it down. If you're drowning in the water, right, and I'm in the water with you, in order to get you out of the water, I have to be above the drowning you're in. Are you with me? So I'm in it, but I also what? Transcends it. Does that make sense? The lifeguard who comes to save you dives into the same water. So they're in the water with you. But you're drowning, and they're saving you. In order to save you, they have to be transcending what they're in. Are you with me? So that's the theistic view of God, that God is in the world, throughout the world, and he transcends it. How many of you understand the theistic view? Wave at me if you got it. If you don't got it, say, I'm, I'm coming with you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Stay with me. The second view is the deistic view. The deistic view says that God created the universe and established moral and natural laws, but does not intervene in human affairs supernaturally. Let me break it down. That God created laws and rules for us to live by 
And once he did that, he stepped outside of it. So whatever happens within the context of that, God does not intervene. That's the deistic view. Are y'all with me? So you know more about theology than you think. You just haven't thought about it. And I'm going to prove it to you. What's the atheistic view? They don't believe in God. Why is it that you know the atheistic view, but you don't know your view? But anyway, that's the difference. Because you don't think theologically oftentimes about your Christian relationship with God, right? So what we're looking at as we talk about this, this theologically, that all Protestantism or all religions based in Jesus Christ has a theistic view of God, that God is the ultimate priority, that he exists and he is imminent in the world, yet God transcends the world. Does that make sense? Yes? Y'all frozen right now. Yo, it was kind of like, okay, all right, all right. Now, why is this significant? Here's why. Your God view, next slide, your God view shapes your morality. Your God view shapes your morality. Your morality refers to the principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. Simply stated, how you view God shapes how you determine what is right or wrong, good or bad behavior. Your morality is shaped by your God view. Does that make sense? Watch this. Your morality provides the basis from which you judge. So when you call a thing right or wrong, good or bad, you judge it. You judge it from your morality, which is shaped by your God view. Are y'all with me? Good. Y'all sure? Okay, now watch this. To act in judgment is to prove the working of your conscience. So, so here's what happens. All right? Your conscience, let me just stay with the notes. Your conscience, let's go to the next slide works to do one or two things, accuse or excuse. Your conscience will excuse or accuse. Now watch this. Before we sin, the conscience tells us that's wrong. <laughs> right? Don't, don't act like you didn't sin. No, don't, don't make me go to that, that scripture. All have sin, right? Now watch this. After you sin the sin that the conscience told you was wrong in the first place, the same conscience does what? Tells you you did wrong. Now watch this. Based on what? Your God view or the morality, the principles of right and wrong that you subscribe to based off of your God view. Now, if you have a atheistic God view, then you can do no wrong. Are y'all with me? Because there's nothing to base it on. You have no morals. Ooh. Are y'all with me? If you have a deistic God view, then you have a view that says, yeah, God made the rules, but I can do whatever I want to concerning the rules because God ain't stopping me. Are y'all with me? But if I have a theistic view, my theistic view holds me 
right? To right and wrong as determined by God. Am I making sense? And if I, watch this, go contrary to what is right or wrong, good or bad behavior as determined by God, I have just stepped away from my confessed theistic view and probably down to a deistic or atheistic view of God. Are y'all are y'all tracking with me? Y'all with me? Talk back to me. Let me know you're not alone. All right. Okay. So now, so now, so so the same conscience that accuses excuses. So on the excuse side, it tells you what? That was right. You did the right thing. That's the conscious. Am I making sense, y'all? Now, why is this important? I'm showing you the link between your conscience and your view of God. Because there is a direct link. There is a link between your conscious and your view of God. Now, let me, let, me, let, me, let me go back and show you this. Remember, theistic view. God is imminent in all things, and he transcends it. Theistic view, God has set rules and morals for us to adhere to, but then he walks away, and he does not intervene in what we do. Or atheistic view, ain't no rules. I do what I want to do. Ain't no God. Right? Now. Your conscience will confirm your view of God. Now, any question on what I've taught? Does it make sense to you, some kind of sense? Okay, let's work a little bit. All right, let's keep moving. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes to Timothy, listen to what he says. He says, now the spirit speaketh expressly. Now, the term spirit there, as indicated by the capital S, right, is not talking about a spirit. It is talking about the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit speaks expressly. The word expressly is directly, emphatically, with, with certain truth. And what the Holy Spirit speaks is, is this, that in latter times, notice it's not last days, it's latter times, some shall depart from the faith. The Spirit says that. The Spirit says expressly that they will depart from the faith, watch this, giving heed to seducing spirits. So their departure from the faith will be because they've been seduced. Are you with me? Then he says, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their what? Conscious sear, the word seared there is why we're talking about the branded mind. How many cooks do I have? Chefs do I have in the house? Want to be chefs. Think they chefs. <laughs> right? Some, hand, some hands went up high, some went down low. So. What does it mean for a thing to be seared? Lightly grilled. Thank you. Lightly grilled. Now watch this. How, excuse me, how hard is it, no, how, how hard is it to season something that has been seared? It's not easy. It's almost impossible. Right? Why? Because the searing seals it to a regard where nothing else added will be received. <coughs> no, excuse me. Y'all with me? <coughs> Timothy's is been, where, where Paul is telling Timothy 
Paul is telling Timothy, now let's look at this text, you see it. He's saying that the seared conscience gives way to speaking lies in hypocrisy because doctrines of devils and, 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 he, and seducing spirits have caused some to depart from the faith. So some depart from the faith because they've given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So they speak lies in hypocrisy because they, they have been seared in their conscience. Does that make sense to you? Which means they are branded because the sear a thing is to brand a thing. Right? I could ask, what type of Christian are you? Now, now watch what I'm going to show you. <clears throat> I can be a Christian with a seared conscience because my conscience is predicated on my God view. The moralities I establish for myself are predicated on whether or not I have a theistic view of God, deistic view of God, or atheistic view of God. If I have an atheistic view of God, I will not receive anything that God gives. Am I making sense? If I have a deistic view, I will only accept those things that are within line with what I want because I know that God is not making me do anything. But if I have a theistic view, I understand that God is in all things and he transcends them. So whatever it is I'm dealing with, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, I still have a God who's with me to pull me out, pull me through, get me over. Am I making sense? When I understand that, then I'll live my life to please God or to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Am I making sense? So my, my, my morals are based in what God says. Are y'all with me? Okay, let's keep working. So the conscience of a person is a person's painful reaction to a past act which does not meet the standard. Let's stop there. So, how many of you um, dated him and, and now all men are dogs? Yeah, somebody, somebody in the back said, that's me. Right? One relationship, don't miss this, Cause you not to trust any man. Y'all are mighty quiet. And I'll say, oh, woman, brothers is in the house, because we go through two. Right? Why? Because that experience and the pain of it left an indelible mark in your mind, in your heart. That's how it got to your mind. Now, every time you see anything remotely close to what that was, you shut it down. Because, watch this, your mind, your conscience has been seared. So you can't have a fruitful relationship with the new guy. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Because you holding him accountable for what the last guy did that you can't get off your mind. Y'all with me? The same is applicable, watch this, with pleasant experiences. I mean, the only reason you keep going back to that restaurant is because you had those pork chops. Are, are y'all understanding? You with me? So anytime somebody tell you, look, try these pork chops, you immediately compare those pork chops to the ones you had years ago, months ago, and now you're tasting them, not for their taste, but for, to see if they taste like those. Are y'all with me? Okay. 
What we are learning then is that pleasant reactions to an act which meets the standard we hold on to. You with me? Negative actions we hold on to. But not, not both of them don't help us. Now, now here's where it's going to get fun. <laughs> Y'all with me? Okay. Did somebody say no? No. Okay. All right. So here's where it's going to get fun. I wish I could separate y'all in teams, but and don't be fighting it because I'm going to give you a test. I'm going to give you a test, right? And, and here's the question. Is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol? Who said yes? You say so? You say so? Okay. Why? Hold on, hold on, y'all. Stay with me. Why the kids raising their hand? We got... I, I ain't even going to that house. Don't even, don't even, don't even look that way, y'all. Look straight ahead. Stay with me. Can y'all still see me up there? I'm sorry. Did I walk out the view? Okay. All right. So, 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 so tell me why, Lisa. Hold on. Before you answer, I'm going to put your name all out on, on. Lisa, tell me why, Lisa. She said, Jesus turned water into wine. That's alcohol. He turned it into wine. He didn't drink it. No, no, no. Tell me why. Why? Anybody else? Ain't nobody else gonna raise their hand now, right? Come on, come on. As long as you don't do it obsessively. Why does it obsessively matter? What y'all mumbling about back there? Huh? What's that, sir? Being drunk. Drunkenness is a sin. That's exactly right. The question, though, is, is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol? So the answer is as long as they don't get drunk. And you base that on what? Okay, so, so you're telling me, you're telling me, your, what the Bible says, but the question is, is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol? We're not talking about being drunk. You say yes. Why? So since you don't think anything's wrong with it, then your answer is yes. So your morality sets the standard. You with me? You see what happened? The only reason that y'all are answering the way y'all answering is not because you're trying to ask the question, you're trying to defend yourself. <laughs> you're, trying to, you're trying to defend yourself, right? Because there's a standard that has been set within your own existence and based on that standard when facing the questions, one or two things is happening. You're either going, watch this, you're either being convicted or condemned. <laughs> Right? Because you're trying to find your moral base. And now, now the preacher is saying, what, what, what's up with that? What, what view do you have of God that causes you to have the morality that says this is okay? And now you go, because I say so. <laughs> Are y'all understanding what I'm trying to show you? Now, that's not the subject matter. The subject matter is morality. I, I'll respond to that later. But don't be trying to change my Bible study class so you can feel better about yourself. Okay. Let me start. Or are y'all with me? Y'all are y'all understanding where I am? What I'm trying to show you is your answers came out of your determined consciousness. Right? Without any thought about much of anything else, really from a defense posture. The question, go back to the question, please. The question, I want you to get this, was, was is it okay for Christians? Right? So now you have, to, you have to go into the realm of what does it mean for me to be a Christian? Or better yet, what do I believe it means to be a Christian? In connection with that, I have to answer the question based off of what? My view of God. Am, am, I, am I making sense? 
if by chance I'm a drunk, stay with me. Sit still, look straight ahead if that's you. Now stay with me, no. I serve a God who's in all, imminent in all things and transcends it. So if I am outside of a moral existence that God has set for me, watch me, y'all. I'm outside of it with a God who has the capacity to deliver me. Do do y'all understand where I am? Okay. All right. All right. This is good. Let's keep working. (laughs) It'll, it'll, It'll make a little better sense. So your conscience, right? has two conclusions of mine. Now, now, it's either condemnation, which means to express strong disapproval, right? Or conviction, which is a sense of judgment or guilt. So when you are, when you are functioning, right, out of the conscience, you've got to understand that your conscience is working to do one or two things, condemn you or convict you, concerning all things. But your conscience will condemn you, watch this, and convict you based off of your determination. Let me make it plain. Or at least try. When you experience continuous condemnation, it's going to lead to rejection. You know, stop doing it. You don't need to do that. Stop doing it. You don't need to do it. Quit that. Do that. You know you, you, that one, right? You shouldn't have done it. 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 Shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it. Even you'll be like, I didn't even get it. You're going to reject it because you've experienced what? Continuous, right? Condemnation. If you experience continuous conviction, it leads to correction. Right? I shouldn't have done that. 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 I really shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. You know what? I'm just going to stop doing that. I'm going to change. Are you with me? Now, If there's an absence of conviction, that absence of feeling guilty will lead to a total rejection. That's why most people come to church, join the church, and don't come back. Because, stay with me, they go do what they do and they don't feel guilty. Watch this. And then, so then watch this. They avoid conviction. And it takes continual conviction to change, not continual condemnation. Continual condemnation leads to rejection. Are y'all with me? Okay. Y'all say, what does this guy do? Just walk. Condemnation is controlled by you. Nobody condemns you. You condemn yourself. Are y'all with me? And you condemn yourself by how you walk or what you walk according to. Go in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. You there? Listen to verse one. There is therefore now what? So stop. Let's pause there. This helps us to understand that there is a possible way to live and or to walk where there is what? No condemnation. Ready? There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Watch this. So I can be saved. Right? And still experience condemnation. Is that what you read? I can be saved. Or a better way to say it is being saved does not Exempt me from condemnation. Are you with me? Why? You ask great questions. Let's keep reading. 
There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh. Uh-oh. So I can be in Christ Jesus and walk according to the flesh. Are you with me? Say sanctified. Right? Name on the road. Hold an office in the church. Everybody know what church I go to. Saved, but not walking what? Watch this. In the spirit, but walking according to the flesh. Right? So there's therefore now no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So watch this. How do I avoid being condemned? Walk according to the spirit. Verse two. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, when I walk according to the spirit, the law of sin and death does not, it, it doesn't work against me. Are y'all understanding what I'm teaching? So if I don't want to be condemned, all I got to do is walk according to the spirit. Well, why would I not walk according to the spirit? Excuse me. Because my mind has been seared that I will not even receive the things of the spirit. So I'm bound. I'm branded. The enemy does not have to worry about whether or not you'll do right. He branded you. And he branded you long time ago. Because you just, all you got to do is think about it. And your whole body, that, that looks too much like that. Are, are you understanding? Okay. So let me, let me, let me, let me keep moving. Here. <coughs> Excuse me. So, okay. In, in, do you all understand where we are, what I've shared with you so far? Yes, good. So here's what, here's what I want to do. When you consider how the mind works, how the mind becomes seared, it does not happen all at once. All right? It's gradual progression of being engaged in things, watch this, that defile you. The root of all seared consciousness is becoming defiled because you are in Christ. Therefore, you should be walking according to the spirit. But something happens in your natural fleshly existence that causes you to register it in your mind and you hold it there so that never again will I go through anything like that with anybody again. Seared, branded. So if by chance, can I, can I, can I, can I, can I teach the way I feel it? If by chance you... <clears throat> you allowed yourself to be promiscuous and sleep with a dog and the dog mistreated you, treated you like dogs treat. You now walk the rest of your life having been treated like a dog, but God sends you somebody who's looking for their spouse and it's you. But because you have been seared in your conscience, he comes along and he's a good guy, and you say something like, he's too good to be true. And it's not that he's proven not to be that not to be good. It's that you got this on your mind. Y'all with me? Now watch what happened. The enemy caused you to say yes to promiscuity at a young age so that he could arrest you at an old age. And you didn't know it was happening. You didn't know it was coming. You didn't know. Watch this. You walked a long time in the disposition, right? And your representation of Christ, watch this, is telling a lie. Because you're believing God 
to be able to do, are y'all with me? Anything but that. <laughs> I'm going to keep moving. Second Timothy says, receiving spiritual lies leads to, when you receive a spiritual lie, right, it'll lead to a seared conscience. Go to Matthew chapter, one more time I got. I can do a couple of these. Go to Matthew chapter 15 in your Bible. If there are any questions online, please let me know. The, what I'm showing you in these in these um, last two slides are, are various things that lead to the seared conscience. And if you have been engaged in any of them at any point in time in your life, you need to understand that you're on a trajectory, right? That thing has the capacity to brand your mind, brand your conscience, so you will always feel, right, condemnation as a result of it, instead of conviction. Because the spirit will convict you, but you got to be sensitive to the spirit in order to fulfill that which pleases God. All right? Uh, Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verses 18 through, through 20. It says, Then Peter answered and said to him, Is that where we are? Let me do this. Let me just do this. Let me just put them on so I can see. Okay, all right. I just started at 15. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Watch this. And they what? Defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are all the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man, right? So, so this, this eating with unwashed hands was a, a, a cultural rule that they expected them to adhere to. And so they thought that if one did that, it defiled them. And then Jesus comes back and says, no, it's not the outward that defiles. Defilement occurs within and then it comes out of the mouth watch this from the what from the heart so when you are defiled when you speak out of an evil heart let me, let me, <laughs> how many of y'all got an ex what if i told you your ex was at the door <laughs> what's what's gonna come up out of you That, that, you, that's, what's, that's what you're going to do. That's what you're going to say. You're going to pray. Why are you going to pray? Why? Okay. I'm going to leave it on. Y'all under, understand what I just showed you, right? The, the only way, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have felt absolutely nothing, none of those feelings about your ex until I said they were at the door. And then immediately, your ex didn't bring the feelings with them. They came up out of you. Are y'all understand what I'm showing you? Right? That, what does that mean? That means you ain't been delivered. It's still here. It's still, it's still a, a, a seer, a brand on your mind. <laughs> well, if I said your ex was at the door, you should run. <laughs> you should run. Okay, so so the impetus is not is not that I, I'm talking about. I want you to get this because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna leave Lisa's question in the land of of laughter. The reality is is if that person still has a hold on your existence, y'all are mighty quiet, right? Thank you, Spirit. That's why we are told scripturally that there's a time to mourn and a time to cease from mourning. This, this grieving for 700 years, over, you, didn't, you didn't spend your whole lifetime grieving over somebody who's lived it. 
That don't make sense. That don't make sense, right? All right. Um, let, let me say this. The word defile there, it means to desecrate for the sake of making comment. To desecrate for the sake of making comment. So what's happening is when the enemy allows the experience to occur and, it, and sears your mind, the whole objective is that from the inside out, he wants you rotten from the inside out. Genesis 34, 2 and 5. Don't turn there. Y'all can read that when you get home. But it's talking about sexual interference. Right? That's, that's just the, the abnormal use of the body and sexuality as God has purpose. Please understand. You, 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 you may be having a good time. I'm just go, we, we, I'm just go, you may be having a good time, but it's having a long-term effect. And the long-term effect, watch this. The long-term effect, you lucky if the long-term effect can be treated medically because the spiritual long-term effect requires, watch this, has a longer lasting effect than any antibiotic. I'm teaching tonight. Alyssa sex and lustful desires. Ezekiel, I won't turn there. Abominations to God, right? What, what do I mean by abominations to God? Well, just things that are, 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 are you're in the atheistic view. You have that negativity about things relative to God. I, I'm not going to walk through all of this. Unforgiven sin that leads to bitterness. Some of you still think God's holding against you your sin. And you say, and so you can't be effective at, watch this, right? You ready? Reasonable service. What's reasonable service? Presenting your bodies as living sacrifice. Wholly acceptable unto God. Unto God. Making sense? You would rather hide from people, right? Than to let God see you. And God sees you anyway. I'm teaching better than y'all shall. I'm going to leave that alone. Ungodly words, attitudes, acts. Why you cuss like a sailor? Why everything anybody says bothers you? They just getting on my nerves. I wish they stopped talking. They're not even talking to you. They're not even talking to you. You just happen to be an ear throw of them. You mad because here's why you're mad. You're not mad because they're talking. You're mad because you're internally vexed, is what the Bible calls it. You're a vexed subject matter ain't even about you. Why don't they be quiet? You say something like they, they voice irritate me. What? <laughs> you're vexed. Are, are y'all are understanding where I am? I want y'all to go make sure y'all got homework. Go read these passages. All right. Lack of the knowledge of truth. Lack of the knowledge of truth. When you don't know what you should know relative to God, a lot of it has to do with the fact that our minds are seared. We won't receive, Paul says, the things of God. And that don't, that, that don't make sense to me. I know it don't make sense to you. <laughs> you understand? You're seared, branded. All right? And then acknowledging and worshiping idols. Let me say something. One of the one of the, I, I, I said this to the morning class. I said to them that um, when I was young, I used to watch Gilligan's Eye. And, and, and don't, don't, don't look at me like that. Don't judge me in that tone of voice. And uh, remember they used to have them totem poles? And, and the Gilligan would be running around scared of stuff sometimes. That's, that's, our, that's our viewpoint of idols, right? But, but, but that's not idols for us. Idols for us is our jobs, our cars, our homes, ourselves. Anything that we put as a priority above God and we, we adore or worship, y'all got real quiet. Adore or worship it is an idol, right? Um, so idol worship is contrary to God, right? And let me close this. Um, Khadija, I want to go back. I think I don't think I put it on there. I want to go back. Yeah, I did. 
First Timothy 4. All right. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Y'all understanding where we are? You could have went, yeah. All right. So I want, I, want, I want to do this verse again, these verses again. And this is what I want you to get if you don't get anything else. All right. Um, how, do, how do I get to the point in my life where my mind, my conscience is seared or my mind is branded? Right. Or how do I know if it's happening to me? That's the biggest picture. picture. How do I know if it's happening to me? Here's, here's how you know. Right. As you go back, go forward. I'm sorry. Right there. This is how I know. All right. The text says that the spirit makes it plain. Right. And it makes it plain that some shall depart. Depart from the faith. Do you remember when um, when Peter, I think I mentioned this last week, said he wouldn't deny Jesus, but shortly afterward, he did the exact same thing. And Jesus told him he would. You know how he knew? He was already distancing himself. He was already separating himself. Sometimes wanting to be the head and not a part. Are you with me? But ultimately, I don't even know him. I don't know where you go when you leave church. But does anybody know you've been there? Do you blend in with the common crowd? Are, are y'all understanding? Now, I know at, at, church, at, at church, everybody, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But when we in the mother's spaces and places, Departing from the faith. If you're departing, then something's happening here. There's, there's some cooking going on up here, right? The other thing he says, he says, giving heed, right? Giving heed. The biggest picture we have of this is, is Eve in the garden, right? God has told her what to do or what not to do. And then in comes this serpent, starts dialoguing with her. And now she's beginning to give heed to what he's saying and question what she heard. Giving heed. Giving heed says, the standard doesn't have to be the standard. I can bend it a little bit. Why? Because it makes sense if I bend it, because if I bend it, then it's okay. I can have, I can, I can have one drink. Y'all I'm not, I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to take your drinks away from you. I'm just saying what I'm saying. I ain't going, this is not, a, this is not about your drinking. We'll do that next week. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. Seducing spirits. They're not, they're, not, they're not blatant. They're seductive. Am I making sense? They're suggestive. They're, they're, they're alluring. Right? And they're spirits. They're not people. They're people being used. You understand? They're not, they're not, they're not word, they're, they're, they're word like, right? Just enough, all right? And then doctrines of devils, doctrines of devils. I shared this with our morning class. Um, you may not know this, but there is um, a satanic religion. They worship Satan. And 
on Tuesdays of every week, they collectively pray against the Christian church. In fact, if you check the news, recent news, I believe it was Lebanon City Schools. Y'all remember? Had a group of people who, young people, they had a meeting, they were Satan worship, and people lost their mind. Right? But well, this is what I want you to get. They have doctrines. They have teachings. And oftentimes, we don't recognize them. And we probably shouldn't be able to recognize them because we should be so incubated against them that they make no sense to us. But most times, we are not incubated with our own convictions, right? That what happens is they offer to us something and we find something alluring about it, not knowing that behind it. And then speaking lies in hypocrisy, right? Saying one thing with an intention of another. These are all the byproduct of a seared conscience, right? So I want you to sit with it. I, I, I can't do any more with that. I, I know I started a little theologically heavy, um, but I want you to keep those views in context that the theistic view says that God is imminent in all things and he transcends them. And if your view in any circumstance or situation is theistic, then you always have room for God's super to dominate your natural. But if it's otherwise, you're going to get trapped into a realm and you're going to become seared, and then you're not going to be able to prove what is the good and the acceptable, perfect will of God. Now, what I want you to take note of is this. Romans 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the next verse says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why you got to rethink it in context of your God view. I'm done for today. Any thoughts, questions, reflections? Any on my virtual? Y'all got all that? That was a lot. Good. I'm glad it was heavy. Your, 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 your life is too significant for it not to be. It, it, we can come in here and, and do a, you know, see spot run, spot run, fast Bible study with you. Um, but that ain't necessary. I would rather you critically think about the life you live in relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And please believe me, I mean, you should be doing theology. And here's the one reason why. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we have to think in terms of our Christianity in view of a theology. Who's the God we serve, right? And so I, I, I could have took that a whole lot deeper, right? Because that, 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 those three views are heavy theology for seminarians. But I didn't want to do I just wanted you to conceptualize it. You don't have to memorize it, right? But you won't ever you won't ever hear the word theology or theistic and not think about eminence. God is with me. We say no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Why? Because Christ saved us, and the God who is omnipresent is with us. And therefore, when the weapon is formed, what does the Bible say? He sets the standard against it. You understand? So we're not just rehearsing scriptures based off of memorization and what we think they mean. We're understanding the God we serve. And we can please him that way. All right. All righty. Nick, you all right? Y'all don't know what to ask, what to say. What Y'all just, 
y'all just like, whoa, whoa. Y'all gonna go home and sleep good in there. <laughs> All right, I, I took, no, I ain't took the alcohol away. You can still rub down in alcohol. You just, <laughs> Uh, I, I will I will say this before I let you go because you asked the question. I shared it with the early class. I'll share it with you all. I am of the mentality um, that that social drinking, right? Social drinking by virtue of fellowship because we witnessed that happen in scripture. Um, festive drinking, right? Festive drinking. We saw that your reference was to Jesus turning water into wine, right? Sherry is absolutely right. I think also in excess, I think I heard that uh, from Sister Renee as well, and drunkenness is what we are attempting to avoid, right? Because that is the altering of your state of existence that opens you up to all kinds of attacks. Do you know, did you know, you do know what they call alcohol, right? Spirits, why do you think they do that? See, huh? It opens you up. And, and, I, and I ain't seen a bottle of Holy Spirit yet. Right? So, so I would say to you, I, I, I would say this to you, honestly. I would say this to you. Think about the context to which you are engaging in when drinking. If you are drinking for relief, something's wrong. Something's wrong, right? So, something's wrong. And so I know so, that's what society, you know, ends your day with a glass of this. Well, okay, do a half a glass, not a half a bottle. <laughs> Be mindful. That's all I'm telling you. Be mindful. Right? All right. Anything else? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for your presence and for the spirit of the room and those who joined us virtually. God, we pray that as we have sown the seed of this word deep within the recessed parts of our hearts, we pray that through continued prayer and further study, this seed is nurtured, that we may become doers of it and not just hearers only. God, we thank you for loving us enough to talk to us concerning the seared mind. Now help us, Father, to, to all things to which you guide and you instruct that we may avoid being victims of living, Lord, for you and living with a seared mind or a diminished view of who you are in our lives. Your presence settles our morality, Lord, and we thank you that we know that you set the standards for our living. Now help us, Lord, to live according to those standards by being sensitive to the Holy Spirit's guidance. God, we thank you for the grace, mercy, and your power to heal, deliver, and set free. We ask for it, God, not only in the lives of those who are assembled and on the line virtually, but also, Lord, for those who are at home, who've come through surgeries, come through procedures. Lord, we ask that you continue to strengthen their bodies day by day, and they may come full circle to the help you have prescribed for their lives. For those that are dealing with tragedies, losses, challenges, or employment issues, whatever the circumstance, we know that you, God, have the supply that we need. And we look to you as the author and finisher of our faith and the keeper and the sustainer of our lives. As we prepare to leave this place, we ask you bless this house we call Mount Carmel. Continue to get your glory out of it. Allow us to continue to be edified. But most of all, let it be a house where those who are lost can come and find you. Lord, we ask as we leave this place, we never escape your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people would say, amen. 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 You all have a blessed night. Church anniversary Sunday. Church anniversary Sunday. Church anniversary this Sunday. Anniversary. Yeah. Service and 4 p.m. service. Yeah. Hello. 4 service. Right. Say Sunday, 4 p.m. Our Bye -bye. guest will be Dr. Samuel Winston, Ohio Baptist General Convention President and the Mount Calvary Nation. Don't oh. let their nation outnumber ours. I know that's right. <laughs>
I won't be able to make it. I got to work that day. I do too.